Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. So since I was a little girl, I've always wanted to make my own shoes. I even made a pair of ballet toe shoes out of duct tape one time. But as an adult, let's be real, no one makes shoes, right? Wrong. About a year or two ago, I found out that there's actually a large amount of people who make shoes in their living rooms or in their houses, just home shoemakers who do it as a hobby. Since then, I was hooked on the idea of making my own shoes. In early 2021, I finished my very first pair of handmade shoes. And ever since then, I've been dying to try it again. Well, it's time. This pair of shoes that I'm going to be showing you exactly how I made in this video will be much more approachable than my first pair. Perfect for a beginner like me and like any of you out there who want to start making your own shoes. So let's dive in. So after making my first pair of handmade shoes, which were hand welted, hand stitched, and took me months to complete, I was really ready to just make a simple, easier pair of shoes that I could whip off pretty quickly just to keep myself interested in shoemaking as an approachable hobby for myself. I was very inspired by Nicole Rudolph's simple shoemaking video where she demonstrated how to make a pair of historically inspired ladies slippers which were very approachable for a beginner and used a cemented process of construction, which is where you basically just glue it together rather than gluing and hand stitching it all together. Not going to lie, my pair of shoes ended up even more simple than her pair. I used a sewing machine to, sh to sew my shoes together, a very simple design and no heel or lift of any kind. They were just completely flat. Another huge inspiration to me was this book, Women's Shoes in America, 1795 to 1930. This book covers the history and the design of obviously women's shoes in America over that time period. And it is so much more comprehensive than I could have possibly imagined. And it's been so helpful of a resource for figuring out what designs I want to make and how exactly the shoes looked helping me to figure out style lines and that kind of thing. This book also has many full color photographs of ladies' shoes from throughout history. And many of these photos were of ladies' slippers of, with a very simple design and with an outer layer of a colored silk. I found this idea so appealing because first of all, I had some silk scraps lying around. And second of all, it's something that you don't see very often nowadays. And I thought it would be something that would instantly give my shoes a historical look even though I'm using a modern pair of lasts and a modern construction method. So basically I had a vague idea that I wanted to make a simple pair of slipper-like shoes, possibly with a fabric outer layer, but I didn't really have any concrete details for the shoes. So what did I do next? Well, the very first step was gathering my materials so that once I did have a design, I'd be able to just jump right into making it. Some of these materials I already had from my previous shoemaking adventure, but for the sake of those of you watching this video who are interested in beginning shoemaking as a hobby, I'm going to go over what I believe are the basic tools and materials that you need for shoemaking. And for more details on this, go to my previous I Made Shoes video and the previous I Made Shoes blog post. I just dive right into all the details of what you need, and why you need it. And I'll also be linking several sources in the description for places where you can find the materials and the tools that I'm mentioning now. So the first thing you're going to need are lasts. Lasts are a foot-shaped or shoe-shaped mold of the foot. You buy it in your own shoe size and you buy it in the style and heel height of shoe that you want to make. So in my case, I bought a pair of lasts in my shoe size and they were flat lasts with an almond shaped toe. So I'm not going to lie, if you're going for totally historically accurate shoes, the shape of lasts that they used back then were different. And in some cases they actually used 
symmetrical lasts, meaning that they didn't differentiate between the left and the right foot. You're gonna have a really hard time finding lasts like that nowadays, unless you can somehow make your own, which is very difficult and I've never tried it. As a beginner, I'll just say, if you want to start shoemaking, just keep it as simple as possible and just find the best pair of modern lasts that you can find that are accessible to you, that are affordable to you, and go from there. You can still make them look historical by using historical style lines and details and even historical construction methods if you so choose. So the next thing you're gonna need is leather. I know we're making fabric covered shoes, but we still do need leather for the inner layers of the shoe as well as the soles. So I used vegetable tanned calfskin for the lining and stiffeners of my shoe. And if you're wondering what stiffeners are, I'm going to get into that a bit later. For the insole, I used a thick vegetable tanned shoulder leather. And for the outsole, I used some pre-cut pieces of good quality sole leather from Leather and Grindery, which will of course be linked below. I like these outsoles because they already had a nice polished look to them. I knew they were going to be a good type of leather for soles and they have this cool stamp on the bottom. They still do have to be cut to the exact shape that you need for your shoes because they're much oversized, but it just made things a little more convenient for me. So the biggest improvement that I made in this, my second pair of shoes compared to my first pair was having more of an idea of what type of leather to buy, meaning that I went for a thinner type of leather than my first pair. In my first pair, I used shoulder leather for both the outer and the lining, and it was not a thin shoulder leather. It was a good thickness and in hindsight, it would have been much easier and produced more comfortable shoes if I'd gone with thinner leather. So that's what I did this time and I'm very happy I did so. Finally, I used some scraps of this beautiful striped silk taffeta that I had left over from a circle skirt project that I made about a month or two ago. This silk fabric was originally from Burnley and Trowbridge. I was a little intimidated at first about the idea of making shoes with stripes and had a hard time conceptualizing how I would lay out the stripes on the foot, but it ended up working out really well and I'll get into a bit of that later. Okay, so now I'll get into some of the basic shoemaking tools. And right off the bat, I'm going to give a big caveat here that I am a beginner shoemaker myself. So some of these tools that I'm using are not necessarily the best quality or the best suited to the job, but I'm recommending them to you and I'm using them myself because they're easily accessible, they can get the job done, and they're not super expensive. So it's an easy way to introduce yourself to the hobby. Again, some links for sources of these tools will be in the description and you can go to my previous I Made Shoes blog post, which will also be linked below for details of the whys and hows of some of these tools. So the first type of tool I'm going to talk about that would kind of fit into that category are knives. So you definitely need some knives for shoemaking. And in theory, it's definitely a good idea to get good quality, really sharp knives. And there are some more generalized shoemaking knives that you can buy that can do a lot of the shoemaking maneuvers that you need to do to make a pair of shoes. So for my first pair of shoes, I basically just used three different knives. I used a utility knife, a craft knife, which is smaller and more precise, and a safety skiver. A safety skiver is not exactly a knife. It kind of looks like a potato peeler. Skiving is something that can be very tricky to do as a beginner. You do need a high quality sharp knife if you're going to do it with a knife. So I opted to use a safety skiver instead, which just takes a lot of the guesswork and you know need for practice out of it. We'll talk more about skiving once we get into the construction if you're interested in what that is and why we do it. Now this time around I did buy a few new knives and I think this is one of the fun things of progressing in the hobby of shoemaking is that there are so many good quality tools out there like knives that are very specialized to help you do specific tasks and I think the more shoes I make the more of an idea I'll have of what tools would be really helpful for me to have and to invest in. One of the knives that I specifically invested in this time is called a clicker knife and I really really loved this knife. It came in super handy for cutting out my pattern pieces but again, a utility knife can do this job just as easily. So you'll also need some glue for shoemaking, especially for this type of shoemaking that we're doing this time, which is a cemented construction where we glue the sole on. So the type of glue you'll need is contact cement. So in my previous video, I used a water-based contact cement because it's less fumey. I was also pregnant at the time. Traditional contact cement that you buy in hardware stores is very fumey and the fumes are quite toxic. So if you are going to use 
use it, you need to use it in a well-ventilated area, possibly wear a fume mask, do it outside, that kind of thing. So my previous pair of shoes were, were hand welted, which meant that I felt comfortable using the water-based cement for the entire construction. I still have to do more research on whether or not water-based cement, contact cement, is strong enough to glue a sole on, but my instinct was to just use the conventional stuff in this pair of shoes that I was making to make sure that that sole would really get glued on there strongly. So I used the water-based contact cement for the construction of the uppers, and then I used the traditional contact cement for gluing the sole on and doing the lasting. And I would open my window and I actually wore a fume mask as well because I want to be careful with toxic fumes. You'll also need some nails for the lasting process. Lasting is when you draw the upper down over the bottom of the insole, you tack it in place, get it all evenly stretched out over the last, and then you take out the nails and glue it down. So I use dedicated lasting nails for this process, which I ordered online and I will link it below. But if you would rather not order those, I think you can probably just use nails from your hardware store as long as they are a similar shape and size. So you want nails that are like one and three quarter inches long or so, maybe just one inch actually, and narrow nails because you want the holes that you make in your last to be as narrow as possible. The lasting pliers are used when we are pulling the leather of the upper down over the bottom of the last, like I just mentioned. It helps you to pull it down tightly and then it has a special knob on it to nail the nails in. The shoemaking hammer is not used to nail the nails in. It's actually used to smooth out the leather because it has a nice rounded head and it's used to help concrete two layers of leather together when you're gluing them. Okay, so now let's get into the pattern making for the shoes. So right off the bat, since I'm talking to probably most of you who are coming from a sewing background, I'm going to talk about the fact that making patterns for shoes is a rather different process than making sewing patterns, at least when it comes to drafting patterns. If anything, it is more similar to draping a pattern on a dress form because we use the last to basically drape our shoe pattern, except instead of using fabric or leather to drape our pattern, we use masking tape. At least that's how we do it in the modern day. The old fashioned technique was sometimes to use leather or to use paper and kind of drape it over the last. But since we have access to masking tape, that's definitely what I'm going to use and what I'm going to recommend to you because it's a lot easier to get an accurate pattern that way. So for me, making the pattern for these shoes was by far the hardest part of the process. And it's not because pattern making for shoes is difficult. It's not difficult at all. But for me, it was hard to just conceptualize what shoes I wanted to make. And it was very easy to kind of see a picture here and a picture there and be like, ooh, I wanna make that. No, I wanna make that. And I couldn't decide. And it was really hard. And I actually would like lay awake at night debating with myself about what style of shoes I should be making first, which is so silly. But when I look back on how I began sewing, it was actually quite similar. When I first began sewing and I didn't know a lot about different details and style lines of garments, it was very easy to just get this vague idea in my head. Okay, I wanna make a white dress and then not be able to take it any further because I had no idea of how to nail down the exact details that I wanted. And it's the same way with shoemaking. So I kind of hope that as I do it more, it will be quicker for me to conceptualize what I want to make and just stick with one idea. So as I mentioned, when it comes to making a shoe pattern, the easiest modern method for a beginner is to wrap your last in masking tape. And you want to do this in a certain way, so I will link a helpful tutorial that I've used in the description. But basically you want overlapping strips of masking tape. You don't just want a single layer, you want, oh, you want to overlap your strips over the whole last and you want to maybe cover it twice in the overlapping strips, just so you have a good thick layer of masking tape. And of course you want to do this with as few wrinkles as possible. I used this green masking tape because that was what I had on hand at the time. Once you get your last completely covered in masking tape neatly, as neatly as you can, you're going to use your utility knife to cut off the extra masking tape around the very top edge of the last and around the very bottom edge of the last. So the, the edge, what's called the feather edge, which is where the side of the last meets the sole of the last and it kind of forms a corner or a ridge. So after after you've done this, you can use a Sharpie or a pen to draw on the style lines of your shoe. 
So the reason ballet flats are so approachable of a style of shoe for a beginner to make is because there are so few style lines. You really just have to draw on the neckline of the shoe, basically the opening of your shoe, the point where the shoe ends and your foot begins. And then you draw on the side seams, which are basically just diagonal seams around the middle of your foot. And you also just want to mark the center front of the last as well as the center back. So the middle of the toe and the middle of the heel. And this will be useful for reference later. So when it comes to historically inspired slippers, I've noticed that they usually have a higher neckline than what's common in modern ballet flats. And I really like that look. I think it's more flattering to a lot of people's feet, mine included. So that's what I chose to do. I made my neckline have an almond sort of shape mirroring the shape of the toe. That's usually a good rule of thumb to go by is that whatever shape of toe your last has, you want to mirror that in the shape of the neckline. So if you have a square toe, do a more square neckline. If you have a pointy toe, do a more pointy neckline. So after I drew my neckline and my side seams, I used my utility knife to carefully cut along those lines that I'd drawn and carefully peel off the, the masking tape pattern for my shoe. before laying it down on paper. But before you can completely lay it down on paper, because this masking tape pattern has been formed over a round object, in order to flatten it out onto paper, we need to make some strategic cuts in the very rounded areas, such as the toe and the heel. So when it comes to the toe area, I just did many cuts all next to each other, forming these little relief cuts all around the toe and then flattened it out that way. When it came to the heel, I just did one big cut right up the center front, but not all the way to the top, forming a dart of sorts, so a triangular opening. We're going to actually sew this dart into the heel of the shoe later. But as opposed to darts in garment sewing, we're actually going to leave this dart open. We're literally going to cut a triangle into our leather. And the reason for that is that we're going to sew these edges together without any added seam allowance because we actually want it to be a little tighter than the actual pattern because the heel area is something that's liable to stretch over time. So we just want it to have a nice snug fit. So after your masking tape pattern has been laid out on either paper or cardstock, we're going to add our seam allowance. So when it comes to the seam allowance of the actual side seams, when it comes to the leather part of the pattern for the lining, we're only going to add seam allowance to one of the sides that's involved in the seam because in leather work, the seams are created usually through overlapping them. So we only need to add seam allowance on the layer that's going to be under the top layer. And I added five millimeters of seam allowance. However, when it comes to making the pattern for your silk layer, or just when you're cutting your silk layer, keep in mind that you're going to need to add about one centimeter of seam allowance to both of the sides involved in the seam because we'll be sewing a traditional garment type of seam. Now finally, you need to add what's called a lasting allowance, which is an allowance all around the bottom edge of your shoe. So the part of the shoe that's going to meet the sole and actually go under the insole and later be sandwiched between the insole and the outsole. This is going to vary a lot depending on how experienced you are. So obviously, since I'm, I'm a beginner and I'm talking to beginners, I used quite a large lasting allowance. In hindsight, I didn't need to make it quite so large. I did a lasting allowance of three centimeters, which if you're an experienced shoemaker watching me, you're probably gonna laugh. <laughs> um, for my first pair of shoes, I did what was still considered a large seam allowance of 25 millimeters, but due to just errors on my part throughout the process, I ended up wishing I'd actually left extra and just had enough to cut off later. So I did three centimeters this time, but you definitely don't need to do that much. 25 millimeters or 2.5 centimeters is definitely adequate. So it's time to cut out our pieces now. So I use what's called a clicker knife, which is a knife specifically designed for cutting out pattern pieces in leather. I really liked this knife. It had a little curved blade and it just felt like it made the cutting process a little easier than the first time when I used a utility knife. But a utility knife would still work well if that's all you have access to right now. So for my fabric pieces, before cutting them out, I first had to decide which direction I wanted them to go over my foot. So I did a few concept sketches for this and then I would actually drape the fabric over it just to have an idea of which way it would look good. So in the end, I decided to have my stripes going forward, like vertically over my toe for the front piece, and then for the side pieces to have the stripes going up like this. 
So I cut out my fabric pieces just using some scissors. And then I also cut out stiffeners. So stiffeners are basically what, what I could refer to as the interfacing of shoemaking. So in modern shoemaking, they'll use some kind of like chemical man-made fabric for this that gets very stiff when you use it, but I prefer to just use another layer of veg tanned leather. It works really well. It's what they used obviously historically. And the great thing about veg tanned leather is that when you wet it and shape it over the last, when it dries, it will hold that shape. And then we'll later use a type of starchy glue that helps it get nice and stiff. So to make the stiffener patterns, I just use my original shoemaking patterns and just cut a line for where I wanted it to end. So there was a toe stiffener, which would go up partly over the toe, and then a heel and side stiffener called a heel counter, which just cups around the heel and over to the middle of the shoe. Now, if I had been making a slipper, which was a double layer of leather, so an outer layer of leather and a lining of leather, I probably would have skipped the stiffeners. But since I was only working with the lining of leather and then a layer of fabric, I decided it was a good idea to add the stiffeners in there as well. So my pieces were all cut out, but before I could start sewing my leather together, I had to skive the edges. Skiving is a process used in leather work where you basically use a knife or a skiving tool to scrape the edges on the flesh side of the leather a bit thinner and how thin you do it is going to depend on your application and in shoemaking you want it to be pretty thin because when these pieces of leather are overlapped you don't want to form any obvious ridge or any ridge that's going to bother your foot later on so i sewed both the leather and the silk layers of my shoe uppers together on my trusty green vintage sewing machine which worked perfectly especially because the leather was so thin it really wasn't any different than sewing fabric but i should mention that before i sewed the leather together i glued it together in exactly the placement that it was going to be this isn't necessarily something you have to do but it's just what i learned to do in shoe making so that's what i did And for the leather, I ended up sewing two seams on the, on the edge just because I thought it looked better. I sewed the silk seams for the silk outer part of the shoe just as you would expect in garment sewing with the seam to the inside of the garment and pressed it afterwards. So now it's time to reinforce my seams. So when it came to the leather layer, I did this using some shoemaking tape, which is basically a very strong fabric tape that's sticky and you just stick it on along the seam and it reinforces the seam. For the silk layer, I also used the reinforcement tape. And then on the outside of the shoe, I created some bias tape, which I stitched over the seam line just because I thought it looked prettier and it also helped to reinforce the seam. It's also a historical detail that you see on a lot of historical shoes. So finally, it was time to attach the silk layer of the shoe upper to the leather layer. And I did this using two-sided shoemaking tape, which is an alternative to glue, really. So you could just do this with glue if you wanted, or you could do it with hand stitches, like a whip stitch around the edge, which would also help reinforce that edge. In hindsight, I forgot to do this, but I should have also used my shoemaking reinforcement tape, which is a very narrow tape of the kind I mentioned earlier, which helps to reinforce the neckline of the shoe, which is liable to stretch. If you don't have shoemaking tape, there are other ways that you can strengthen this edge like just doing a whip stitch as I mentioned and finally I bound the neckline of the shoes using matching silk bias tape so I first sewed it around the inside by machine and then I flipped it over to the outside and sewed it down by hand So our uppers are all finished and it's time for the funnest part of shoemaking, which is lasting the shoes. This is fun because it's the part when you really start to feel like your shoes are real shoes and they look like shoes. So the first step is going to be making our insole, which is basically like an inner sole piece of leather that your foot rests against. And we're going to be gluing our upper down against this. So traditionally shoemakers will cut their insole to shape nailed on the last and they just cut around the edge of the last. But as I learned from Nicole Rudolph's video, an easier method for a beginner is just to create a template, like a paper pattern for the sole of your last 
masks as best as you can. And you can also use the masking tape method for this if you prefer. And then to just cut out that template out of your leather and then it's already the right size and you don't have to worry about cutting it on the last if you're not used to using a knife in that way. Before doing this, I chose to just sky down the outer edges of the insole a bit. I'm not sure if this was the right thing to do, but that's what I did. And my insoles were wet at this point when I was cutting. That's something I should mention that when you're dealing with thick leather, it's always best to wet it first before you cut it because it's softer and more malleable. And after it was cut and it was still wet, I strapped it to the bottom of the last to get it to mold to shape as it dried. This is not super necessary on flat shoes like what we're making, but it's a really useful thing to know if you're ever making high heel shoes where the insole has to be very curved. So it's time for lasting. So I first fasten the insoles to the bottom of the last using three lasting nails at the toe, the middle, and the heel. And then it was time to attach my uppers. So I first nailed the upper at the back heel area in an inconspicuous spot. and then I pulled it down, holding the last in between my legs, and I just put nails in strategic areas to get it all balanced on the last. So first at the heel and the toe, and then each of the sides. And I did these nails through the silk and the leather. Once it was all on the last evenly, then I carefully removed one nail at a time, and then I placed it back in, but just through the leather lining layer. We're going to be lasting the shoe in stages. First the lining, then the stiffeners, and then the outer fabric. So lasting is a process. It's something where you first start out rough and then you gradually redo it and redo it and refine it until it's exactly the right way you need it to be. So first you just get the nails in all the places, especially the toe, the sides, and the heel, and you're going to have some pretty big wrinkles going right up into the shoe. But don't worry about that in the first stage because you keep coming back to the areas, you remove the nail, and then you use your lasting pliers to pull that wrinkle down more. And usually the crease will separate into two smaller creases. And then you put your nail back in between those two creases. And you just keep repeating that and repeating that until your creases get smaller and smaller. And eventually until they're so short and small that they don't reach up into the shoe at all they just are on the bottom of the shoe and you want them to be as short as you can get them to be so you should be able to get the sides of the shoe upper completely flat the toe and the heel area are going to have wrinkles but you just want them to be as small as possible and to start as far back as possible from the feather edge. Don't worry about the wrinkles in the very middle of the sole of the shoe because we're going to be trimming that excess leather away afterwards. So now it's time to glue down our lining. So we work in stages with this. So I started out just by gluing one section. So I, I would remove all the nails from that section, apply my glue, which was conventional contact cement or rubber cement. And it requires a few minutes to cure before you stick it down. So I would get one side, the glue applied, and then remove the nails from another side and get the glue applied there. And then I would go back to the first side and press it down and use my hammer to push it down and to push out any wrinkles that there were. And I just kept repeating this on all the areas of the shoe until it was all glued down. Then I could use my knife to carefully trim away the excess. There was probably a better way to do that, this than what I showed in the video, like going at it more from the side because my knife did end up making some cuts into the actual insole. It didn't go all the way through, thank goodness, but it, it was a bit scary. Like I didn't know if I'd gone all the way through or not. It looked like it could have and that scared me. So the next time I make shoes, I'm going to find a better way to do this or maybe get a better knife to do this with. I think you can also use a safety skiver to do this or to do at least part of this process. After the extra leather was trimmed, then I used my knife sideways to just shave off some of the bulkier wrinkly areas because we want this to be as flat as possible so when we're wearing our shoe, we don't feel any awkward ridges from the wrinkles underneath. Okay, so we're done with the lasting of the lining and it's really satisfying to see it. So the next step is adding the stiffeners. So the stiffeners are going to be lasted in exactly the same way as the lining, but we first have to make sure that it's sitting in the right area on the top of the shoe. So I used a couple nails to fasten it at the top of at the top edge of the stiffener, and we also apply some special glue. So I used 
this type of glue, I believe it's German, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it's a starchy glue, which means that when it dries, it gets very stiff. Now, the first time I made shoes, I literally made my own. You can make your own using anything that's starchy. So I used cream of wheat and I just made a cream of wheat paste and this worked just as well. It's a little more of a hassle, but if you don't wanna buy this stuff, then try a cream of wheat or try something similar. So you just apply your starchy glue to the lining and to the underside of the stiffener before pressing it down onto the last. And then you proceed to last the bottom of the stiffeners in exactly the same way as we did with the lining. Once it's all lasted and glued down, we're gonna trim down the extra leather just like we did before. And then finally, we're, gonna, we're going to apply our starchy glue to the outside of the stiffeners as well. So now it's time to last the silk outer layer of fabric, which is really fun because we're almost done. So just draw this down over the whole shoe. Don't worry about that starchy glue. We actually want it to get glued to the silk and it's just gonna help make the toe area and the heel area nice and stiff and hold their shape really well and then just proceed to last it in the same way. Lasting fabric is a bit different than leather. It doesn't stretch as much and you just have to be more gentle with it, especially if you're working with silk, but just do your best and just try to make sure that there aren't any bubbles of fabric up higher in the shoe. Now, the second time I did this, I, I was a little more preoccupied at the time with my kids and I did end up with some bubbling fabric, but it wasn't, it's not too noticeable, but it was just bothered my perfectionism at the time. But don't be perfectionist about this, just do your best. So after it's all lasted with the nails, we're going to glue it down the exact same way as we did the leather and then trim down the extra. The good thing about the fabric is that it's not going to be as bulky as the leather was. So it's time to finish up our shoes with an outsole. So as I mentioned in the materials section, I used some pieces of sole leather that were pre-cut, but they're still large. They still have to be trimmed to shape. And I used my template to trim these to shape after they'd been soaked in water, which made them soft and easy to work with. Definitely soak your sole leather before attempting to cut it and it will save you a lot of danger to your fingers. So I then feathered the edges, which just means I used a knife to just thin down the outer edges, which just makes shoes look, look a bit more streamlined and more feminine. If you look at men's shoes versus women's shoes, often they'll leave the soles thicker with men's shoes, but if you're going for a historically feminine look in your shoes, then it's a good idea to trim down the edges at least a little bit with a knife or a skiver. I then sanded the edges smooth using my metal rasp and then sandpaper before finally using my burnishing tool, which is just a tool to smooth down the fibers of leather to rub the edges really smooth and get them as polished as possible. This definitely <laughs> didn't look like a professional shoemaker would do, but I did my best and it was a big improvement from how the soles and heels looked on my first pair of shoes. So there's been some progress there. <laughs> After this was done, it was time to glue them in place. But before I applied my glue to the bottom of the shoes, I used the sole and a piece of chalk to just trace around the outline of where the sole would be sitting. So I knew exactly where to apply my glue. After my glue had cured, I stuck my soles in place and liberally applied my shoemaking hammer to just make sure it was really stuck in place, especially around the edges. And then I let them sit overnight and the soles were in place. So finally, it's time to remove our last. So my last have what's called an alpha hinge, which means there's this hole at the top and you can stick something like a screwdriver into it, a screwdriver without a tip. So just like the part of the screwdriver that receives the tip. If you were a professional shoemaker, there would be special tools for this, but I don't have that. So screwdriver it was. So you just kind of hold the last between your legs and you stick the screwdriver in. And when it's in, you just kind of push down on it to try to like force the bottom of the last to close in that hinge. And it does take a lot of force, but eventually it closes and then the last is able to be slipped out of the shoe. And there we go, our finished shoes. It's so exciting. So an optional step would at this point be to add what's called a sock liner, which is just an extra little piece of thin leather in the shape of the insole that you just line inside the shoe with. 
and this would be nice to cover up any ugliness. My shoes do have a bit of discoloration from the metal on the bottom of the last, but at this point I'm not worrying about it. So how do I like these shoes? I'm super happy with them, mostly in just how quick it was for me to whip these off compared to my first pair of very complicated shoes. Apart from the pattern making and the cutting out, these shoes just took me a week of working on in my spare time to finish, so it was really quite approachable. I'm also really happy with how they look. I'm usually not a big fan of ballet flats, but the fact that I made these myself and that they have this unique striped fabric on them makes them feel like they could be my next favorite shoes. Now they do feel a tad bit big, mostly around the top line of the shoe, because the bottom of the shoe, I'm pretty sure it fits me fine, but the top line, it's either something to do with the pattern, like maybe if I make these shoes again, I'll alter the pattern, just have a little less extra at the top, or it could just be because I didn't reinforce the top line properly when I was making the shoes and maybe it got stretched during the process. So next time I make shoes like this, I'll definitely pay more attention to that. But other than that, I really love these shoes and I especially love how they make my feet look. I definitely have bigger feet. That it has been like a self-conscious thing of mine and I like that these shoes are kind of slimming on the feet, not just because of the vertical stripes, but also because of the fact that it has a higher neckline than modern ballet flats. So I really like how they turned out. Okay guys, thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like. Leave your comments and questions below. Feel free to contact me or leave me a comment if you have any questions about this process. All my social media links are in the description and the accompanying blog post will also be in the description with full blown written details of this process. I'll also link other resources for you below as well as my previous I Made Shoes video and blog posts. Okay guys, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you soon. Bye.